Hello and behind me is an Antonov AN-22, which was the first wide-body transport aircraft and it remains the largest turboprop aircraft flying in the world. And in this video, I'm going to take you on a detailed tour. First, I'm going to walk around the outside and point out what makes it unique and interesting, and then we're going to climb inside and have a look in there. So let's get into it. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes. This includes reviews of flights around the world and guided tours through interesting aircraft in museums. Please check out my channel and subscribe. And a massive thanks to the Technik Museum in Spire, Germany for letting me film this aircraft. Check out my videos on their supersonic TU-144 and Buran Orbiter. In the late 1950s, the Soviets needed a larger military aircraft that could transfer equipment faster than rail over massive distances, and at the 1965 Paris Air Show, the UN-22 was revealed. And when it first flew in February 1965, it was the largest flying aircraft in the world. Starting at the front, we have this ray dome with the ground mapping radar sensor in it, and directly above that in the glass house is the navigator's position. Above them, and you can just make out the canopy, was the main cockpit with the rest of the crew and we'll mention that once we get inside. This here, and there's one on the port side as well, is the heat exchanger air intake. Cold atmospheric air would enter here to cool the very hot, high pressure air bled from the engines, so that it could then be ducted into the cabin to maintain pressure. This here is the exhaust from the auxiliary power unit. It actually had two APUs, allowing them to operate a whole array of systems on the ground at remote airports, although this example only appears to have one. As you see later, there are electric internal hoists that could be used to speed up the loading process, and these would all require a lot of energy. Having two also provided redundancy if one broke down. Now to mention this massive fairings on both sides of the fuselage. To keep the whole aircraft low to the ground, which would help the loading and unloading, they either had to use very small wheels or raise the cargo floor. They got around this by moving the landing gear to the side of the cargo compartment and installed these large fares for the retraction mechanism and other systems such as the APU that I mentioned earlier. Obviously it would create a lot of drag and slow their cruise speed, but it's a propeller driven cargo plane so top speed wasn't a priority. The main landing gear consists of massive wide tyres, and it originally came with the ability to change the air pressure in flight so they could leave the pressure up for the tarmac landings and reduce the pressure in flight for landing on rougher runways at the destination and then do the opposite on the return journey. Each pair of wheels has its own independent strut, providing redundancy if there was a failure and it can land safely if two of the six struts don't extend down. They can also rotate up to five degrees, resulting in less stress during taxiing. Now let's mention these four Kuznetsov NK12 M8 turboprop engines. These are shared with the TU-95 bomber and the TU-114 airliner, although slightly modified. Now the latter two aircraft position their wings low to the ground and they're fitted with 5.6 meter propellers. Because the UN-22 has a high wing design, there were no size constraints and it could therefore be fitted with larger 6.2 meter contra-rotating propellers. Each single engine drives a pair of propellers spinning in the opposite directions to each other and this design was widely used in the USSR. Now single props create a lot of rotational airflow which is essentially just wasted energy and it also causes problems when it hits the vertical stabilizer. Adding the second prop essentially does the opposite cancelling out the problem. But while it does create more power, therefore the TU-144 that I mentioned earlier was the fastest turboprop ever, there is the added mechanical complexity and weight and it's also quite a lot louder. The props also had a variable pitch, which means that they could change the angle and push thrust forward, acting as brakes. These provide 11,000 kilowatts each, propelling it to a top speed of 740 kilometers an hour. Now that's not bad, considering it has a max takeoff weight of 250,000 kilograms. Now while the speed was never going to be as impressive as a jet, these turboprops are more fuel efficient, thus enabling it to carry less fuel and more cargo. Another advantage of props is that they provide thrust from in front of the wing immediately from idle, thus creating lift, as opposed to a jet, where the thrust is produced behind the wing, so it has to build up speed before any lift is created. Because of this, the UN-22 only requires 1,100 meters to take off. The wing is trapezoidal in shape and has 10 internal fuel tanks. There were no lift devices on the leading edge, although there's double slotted flaps on the trailing edge to help low speed performance. Now let's check out this very unique looking tail end. 
the whole end is raised as to allow easy access into the cargo hold. This would then push the fin upwards and make it too tall for hangers, so they decided to spread the lateral control surface over two fins positioning them above and below the tailplane, thus reducing their overall height. Another reason was because of the large cargo doors. The tail section was less rigid, so they were concerned about potential torque load from a single large fin and rudder. Again, spreading this over two fins would help spread out the load. It's quite a clever design, and also positioning the fins directly behind the propellers gives it greater control surface authority. And while it wasn't planned to fly into combat zones, there would be greater redundancy if one failed or was damaged, as they could maintain control with the other one. And looking at the wings from this angle, you can see this slight anhedral shape, which means that they droop down slightly towards the wingtips. This allowed for greater side wind stability. The massive cargo doors, and we'll look in there shortly, are divided into two sections, with the lower section forming a ramp which then had extendable toes so vehicles could drive directly up onto it. The upper doors could also raise, making for a larger opening. Now it's always hard to appreciate the size in footage, but this really was a much larger aircraft than I was expecting. Antonov himself mentioned the angst that they all had about designing such a large, wide fuselage. Now this was the era of narrow body aircraft, and even long haul jets like the 707 were no wider than a modern day short haul 737. So something like this was really quite anxiety provoking. I suspect there would have been a lot of naysayers, as there was with the 747, which was also massively bigger than anything else at the time. It's a high wing design, which has a number of benefits for a cargo transporter. It lifts the wing spar up above the cargo hold so it's not getting in the way. It also lifts the engines up above potential debris that you might find on remote runways where this might operate. And as I said earlier, it allows for large propellers. The downside is that the engines are a long way up in the air, complicating maintenance. Let's climb up these stairs and have a look inside. We enter the aircraft via the port entry door, which is within the flaring. Now as we step through it, you can see how wide the fairing is itself. As well as containing a number of systems I mentioned earlier, it also includes extra fuel tanks. And here we are entering the main cargo hold, which is 4.4 meters wide, 4.4 meters high, and 32.7 meters long. The floor was also made of high strength titanium because it had to be especially strong to hold the cargo down, but also maintain some rigidity for the whole airframe. One of the design requirements was that it could carry the venue BMD-1 armoured vehicle, and while the UN-12 could carry one of these, this aircraft could carry four of them. It could also carry 290 soldiers and paratroopers, a medium tank like the T-62, and most other Soviet fighting aircraft or helicopters. In fact, it has set multiple payload world records, with a maximum payload of 72,500 kilograms, although it has carried up to 100,000 kilograms due to some unique interpretation of the owner's manual. This record wasn't broken again until the arrival of the American C-5 Galaxy. It had a range of 11,000 kilometers, although that was reduced to 5,000 kilometers if fully loaded. I mentioned the cabin pressurization before, and both the cargo hold and the crew compartment, which we'll enter shortly, are separate. This means that if they're only carrying vehicles, then they don't have to waste precious energy pressurizing the cargo hold. But if they are carrying people back there, then the whole plane can be pressurized. On the left, there is the door that we just entered in, and there is a door on the opposite side as well. Moving further forward, we see these electric hoists capable of lifting up to 2,500 kilograms. These move along two rails, running along the full length of the aircraft and help speed the whole loading process. Now I should mention the Russian name for the UN-22 was Antai, named after a Greek mythological figure, although the NATO reporting name was Koch. Now let's move through this airtight door and into the crew compartment. Immediately to the left are the stairs up to the cockpit, but we'll first go straight ahead and look at the navigator's position. A number of Soviet era aircraft position the navigator in this position, and they would use visual references, that ground mapping radar that I mentioned earlier, and other navigation devices to direct the flight. Now we'll spin around and head upstairs. While this wasn't designed to drop bombs, it was fitted with aiming equipment to drop cargo, including supplies and even tanks that would be released at the back with a parachute. Now apologies for the break in the footage as my GoPro overheated. Now we've jumped up to the top deck and you can use this window to inspect the cargo hold and you can see those hoists that I mentioned earlier. Spinning around and moving around the scaffolding that will crawl up shortly. Now apparently 29 passengers could also be accommodated in this section and there were usually 6 crew. Let's have a brief look at the cockpit. 
There's two pilots facing forward and a middle seat for another assistant. While this plan still flies now, the dials are all analog. As aircraft got bigger, the control surfaces would be more difficult to move, so this was fitted with hydraulic boosters, although if there was a failure with this system, the crew could operate fully manually, which would have been quite a workout. Here on the left side was the rearward facing radio operator, and on the opposite side is the rearward facing flight engineer. Check out my TU-144 video where I climb into the captain's seat for a real immersive Soviet cockpit experience. It really was incredible sitting inside that fascinating piece of engineering, and I really appreciated the museum for opening it up to let me film so that I could share it with all of you. It was especially interesting seeing it sitting right next to an old Air France Concorde as well. Now spinning around again, we look out of these port side windows, and that's an incredible view of those two turboprops and wings. There's just something that gets your av geek blood running by looking at views like this. In fact, and this has nothing to do with the Antonov, but is very cool nonetheless, this channel started seven years ago with simple camera phone footage of airplane bits from inside the cabin. Between 1965 and 1976, 68 of these were built and 9 were lost in crashes, which is not a great safety record. In 1984, one of these was being used as a troop carrier and shot down at near Kabul, killing all 250 on board. One aircraft was fitted with a small nuclear reactor, with the idea being that the conventional engines would operate during takeoff and climb, while the nuclear reactor would operate at cruising speed. This would enable a range of 27,500 kilometers and a flight time of over 50 hours. In addition to the reactor and the lead protective layer around it, it would also carry weapons and equipment to track and destroy submarines. The reactor itself was designed to be ejected and land via a parachute system elsewhere in the case of an accident. Over 20 test flights took place, but the program was eventually cancelled. There were also early plans to launch ballistic missiles and even a passenger version with a lengthened fuselage and two decks capable of carrying over 700 passengers, but these never eventuated. While production ceased decades ago, a number of UN-22s still operate both military and civilian cargo roles. Its cargo hold is larger than that of an IL-76, and the larger and faster UN-124 is more expensive and can't operate on small runways, so we'll keep seeing the UN-22 for a while yet. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and check out my channel for many other similar videos, including the TU-144 and Buran also on display at the same museum. Thanks for watching.